Hi everyone, I'm in Sydney. I'm at the Odma Fair and I'm going to head in and have a chat to Tim Thurn, who's a professional services manager for Essilor for Australia and New Zealand and an optometrist, about what the ideal spectacle lens is for a myopic child. Let's head on in. So here I am with Tim. Uh, we're inside Odma. It's a little bit noisy, but hopefully you can still hear us. And we've already had a really fantastic conversation about progressives versus bifocals, what sort of bifocal to use. And so I think we've got quite a bit of interesting stuff to talk about. So first of all, Tim, what can you tell us about picking a progressive versus picking a bifocal for a myopic child? Yeah, I think it's really interesting from the research. When we look at using a progressive, the couple of things that stand out that came out from the Comet study. So number one, if you're just looking at uh, progressives overall, you're probably not going to uh, get the results you want unless you get into targeting who you're going to use. Mm. So the couple of things that we know are that number one, these are fours and with a lag greater than at least 0.4. So you're going to get a result with them. On top of that, the other factors are, number one, you want a short progression to start with. And all of the studies where you've had a result, and looking at Learning and Brown and people from Hong Kong and other Chinese studies, you're looking at a high end, you're looking at a two. Mm. Now, mm. we use a product that has a 150 as an option, but the two is the most sold. Now, we were also talking just before, Kate and I, about aspericity as well, because you're looking at giving the right power all the way into the periphery of the lens, mm. uh, not just in the central part of it. And we don't know how much of a factor that is, but when you think about ortho K and its optical zone and creating that, that nice smooth surface and getting results, maybe aspericity plays a role as well. So earlier when we were talking, Tim, you were uh, saying that for the child with the ESO or the lag, as you mentioned before, progressives will be suitable. Yeah. Obviously there may be other factors at play such as parental concerns, uh, concerns about aesthetics, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. But we were also talking about whether a progressive or bifocal is superior for myopia control in terms of the child accessing the ad. And if we've got a bifocal lens that sits in a really good position on a child's face, they get straight down into that full ad. Uh, if they're wearing a progressive, what do you think yeah. the ideal progressive lens design needs to have for a well, child? When, you, when you're looking at a progressive, particularly in a short, you have a zone over which you have the change taking place of about 9 millimetres. So that's around about from pupil centre out to maybe top of lower lid, you know, kids have got big wide open eyes. So what you're getting is a gradual increase in the ad anyway. and. You know, that's also going with their convergence, etc. So I don't know that it's it's I don't know that it's too much of a bother having the progressive change. But like you say, one of the things about the prism control bifocal is the fact that you have 100% of the ad when the lens is in the right position. We were talking about targets as well. If people are using low dose atropine, we're again not sure because. According to the studies, they're saying that there's not that much of an impact on their range of accommodation. Mm. But even still, do we need to have some backup for their accommodation mm. if yeah. you're using low dose atropine? Yeah, and we as don't well? we don't know yet what happens to the lag of accommodation. So we know that the low dose atropine studies have shown a reduction in amplitude of accommodation of around two to three diopters. Yeah. But we don't know exactly what's that that's doing functionally to lag, to facility of accommodation, to positive relative accommodation, that yeah. sort of thing. So I think we could expect that if we're starting a child on low dose atropine treatment, that they're likely to require some support at near, yeah. uh, particularly if they're entering into that with any sort of accommodative issue or, or with an esophoria. So we were talking before about which type of bifocal to use and there'd been discussion this week on the Myopia Profile Facebook group about an ESEG bifocal versus a D35 or a D28 and what we should use. And something that I think is important when we're talking about Desmond Cheng's study, uh, which is the key prismatic bifocal study that, that Tim and I have been talking about, is that this prismatic bifocal only included two basin prism in each eye in the reading segment of the lens. It wasn't across the whole lens. And the idea there really, what we were talking about, was to make sure that if we're using a single ad, a two ad, as Tim was saying, is most popular, that that single ad is likely to apply itself best across a range of four ears. So we know an ESO is going to love an ad, regardless. The ortho hopefully shouldn't turn exo from an ad, but base in prism helps to balance that. Yep. And the idea of base in prism with an exophore is it doesn't make them hugely exophoric or make them decompensate. So we were talking earlier about which ad to use. You said two is most popular. Yep. Studies with lower ads just didn't show as much efficacy, at least yeah. in progressive. Yeah, I mean that's that's been that's been the case. You know, Comet was with a two ad, Learning and Brown were, were with two ads, um, the Chinese studies were with two ads. So 
at that point in time looking at less the ones using a one ad or a 150 they weren't as efficient at, as at controlling myopia as, uh, as the other studies were and again you know we were talking with the prism control bifocal as well you have the, the right amount of ad and you don't have to have prism into the distance portion of the lens as well once you start talking about the desecs and so on, if you're going to put in prism control and not have it across the whole lens, you're talking about a slab off and mm. you're talking about the aberrations that come with that. And again, you know, we're talking about really cleaning up um, what's, what that patient is actually seeing and not having aberrations and not having uh, power, power problems in the periphery and so on. So it should be, as, I think, as clean as possible. So when do you think we could just use a normal bifocal, just a normal one that we use in our 85 year old old lady who's always worn progressives, sorry, bifocals, not worn progressives, when do you think we can just use a standard bifocal for myopia control? Uh, that, that one I, I don't know because um, the study that was done with uh, Ching and, and uh, Bjorn Drobe and, and Katrina Schmidt was, was looking at single vision pri uh, prism control versus uh, uh, mm. uh, the, the type of segment we're talking mm. about. Ordinary bifocals, I think really, we've got a number of summaries on studies, but again it was the ESO group yeah. and with higher progression mm. where those bifocals were working as opposed to um, people with a lower progression, they weren't getting as big a result. And afterwards we might show you a couple of graphs on that. Mm, yeah, I think that would be useful. So ultimately we've got a lot of spectacle lens options for my AP control and it might be the case that an ad is an ad, it is an ad, regardless of how it goes in front of the eye. Uh, definitely there's a case for really looking at what's happening with binocular vision because there's no doubt those ESOs and lags are going to benefit from an ad regardless of how you put it in front of their eyes. But if you're looking for an option to give an ad and to know that it's going to work to some degree across different four ears, then that's when this prism control is an option. Yeah, it's more or less go large, you know, yeah. go Do, large. Would you be worried at all about older kids coping with a plus two ad? Um, that's an interesting question. We do a little thing where we actually uh, take people who are emotropic and we show them what it's like to wear a presbyopic correction and we put them into a bifocal and the worst thing of course is, is you push them up ramps and stuff and watch we them, get them trip to over. walk up and we get them yeah, to walk up and down stairs and walk around <laughs> and you see you know these people they're 19 or 18 and they're hanging onto the handrail and dropping it's their suddenly head old. down yeah. yeah suddenly old and so it is a factor to consider you know you're talking young active people and so a bifocal in a prominent position is going to be a problem with uh, mm. mobility mm. and you know God help us, we still give them to old people who are actually really yeah. immobile and, yeah. uh, you know, you can kill them, basically. Mm. Falls, you know, hip and leg injuries are what kill old people. So. Yeah, yeah. Spectacle lenses can kill, but mostly they're really good. <laughs> yeah, don't tell them, I'm going to give you this and you might die. You know? <laughs> That's not the case. It's mainly about vision, not death. <laughs> so we'll just show you a couple of graphs so you understand a little bit more about the different types of bifocals and also the prism bifocal because it's a really important point. Okay, so this comes from the, the Cheng study, as you can see on the graph here. So you've got two groups. You've got people who are progressing at less than 0.50 a year versus people progressing at more than 0.50 a year. You can see the single vision, that VL is vision away, so distance vision versus bifocal versus prism control bifocal. You can see when the progression is higher, the prism control bifocal is, a, is impacting far more uh, than progression that's less than 050. So this graph really shows you the difference between what happened in the study with the single vision, the single vision wearers versus the uh, prism control bifocal group. Now, uh, Kate made a really good point before that the ESO group in this study was quite small and so they may actually be tipping over into the, into the ortho group. But you can see that the EXO, less than 1.5 doctors of EXO with the prism control, they were getting a 62% advantage in terms of uh, reduction in their progression versus the single vision group. And in the ortho group, about a 50% reduction in progression versus the single vision group as well.
So as Tim mentioned, I think that part of the reason why those results have occurred as they are is a small ESO group in that particular study and the way that the ESOs were measured at baseline. But I think the really interesting thing there is, number one, that there's a benefit for EXOs um, with the PRISM control, yep. that we have to be careful just whacking an ad on every kid, that we do need to see what that might do to their binocular yep. vision. But also that there is no doubt that there's a benefit for ESOs in, in lots of studies that have been done on progressive yeah. lenses and on bifocals as well. Yeah, we've got a nice lot of studies. The summary shows that the ESO groups perform better in terms of control particularly with, with spec lenses of most kinds. Mm, so yeah. it's it's a pretty definite thing. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So I've just been joined by Dave Nelson, who's got a practice in Toowoomba in Queensland. He's just sidled up to Tim and I, and um, we were just talking about use of these lenses in clinical practice. So Dave, when do you use the, um, the prism control bifocal, and, and what sort of patients are you choosing to use this lens for? Well, as a, well, I'm trying to avoid giving them a distance lens up to about 6.9, but when we get 6.9, 6.12, they're starting to have trouble at school, so mm. it, it's what we had to do it. And some of the science sort of says that after that 6969 the, the uh, myopia uh, increases faster yeah. with under correction. Mm. So it's my next step in terms of giving them the first distance prescription, but also giving them a, a good bit of help in the near range to sort of offset the whole problem. Yeah. It's then really a step before you go to what they came, mm. that's what we've been doing. Mm. Yeah. I've been very happy with, with the results. And I think, you know, in terms of when the science, Chen was studying uh, first generation Chinese immigrants in Canada, so that were getting worse yeah. quickly, yeah. Who, were, who were already on that, that steep decline. Yeah. Yeah. So he was getting you know, reasonable results on a really hard group to stop. Yeah. So yeah. our groups, I mean, we have more sunshine, we have less education pressure. It's a little our, colder in Toowoomba yeah. than it is in Brisbane. I grew up there, so, <laughs> but there's still quite a bit of sunshine. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Dave. So, Tim, what do you think is meaningful myopia control, clinically meaningful myopia control? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question, Kate, and I think the definition of this is going to be helpful for people as well. Remember that if you are dropping their progression rate by 50% or more, reducing it by 50% or more, you're probably going to help them not get above minus four. And that's where all the risk factors come in. Now we've got a chart we can show you about this because the risk factors, once you start heading up above minus four di diopters of myopia, it's quite significant. So this is what we were just talking about. When we look at the risk factors involved with being a progressive myope, or being a high myope, when you're minus eight, you have a 30 to 40% risk of developing uh, myopic retinopathy as opposed to when you're minus four. So you go from that 30% risk down to a 3% risk at minus four and below. That is clinically significant. The myopia products that we have are available. Contact me if you want to know about them. We've got a short summary I can send out to you. Fantastic. Thanks very much. We'll pop Tim's contact details in the comments. Good. Please um, drop any comments below and subscribe to the Myopia Profile YouTube channel as well so you can get updates of all of the myopia musings and anything myopia. Well, it turns out Tim and I could talk about myopic spectacle correction all day, but we've both got various things to go and see and other people to talk to than each other. Yeah, um, So thank you so much for <laughs> oh, a fantastic chat. Thank you, Kate. Chat. It's really good.